Hey, how's it going? More than likely this will be the last video of the year and I wanted to do something a little bit different and I decided to do a generation 1 nuzlocke. There are lots of different rules you can do for a nuzlocke, but here are the two very basic rules so let's get those out of the way before going any deeper if you aren't aware of what this is. The first rule is that if a Pokemon faints, it is considered dead, that Pokemon is then boxed or released, never to be used again. Number two, I can only catch the first Pokemon in each route, there is no second chances, but I will have a species clause meaning that if I catch an oddish on one route and then later in the game I encounter another Oddish or a Gloom or something. I can then skip that and catch the second encounter. You get the idea. Nicknaming is also common just so it hurts a little bit more when you fail and I'll be doing that but don't really consider that a rule. Now let's get into the more hardcore rules that I'll be going by as well. Number three is that the game will be played in set mode. This just means you won't get the heads up of what Pokemon's coming in and you don't get the free switch. I think everyone should play Pokemon like this but it's important to increase the difficulty and give yourself some semblance of challenge. The fourth rule is no use of items in battle. I mean seriously what's the point of a Nuzlocke if you're just going to potion every turn to get out of your problems? What's wrong with you? And number five is that the maximum level I can grind to is limited by the level of the next gym's ace. For example Brock has a level 14 onyx so that's as high as I can grind before beating him then level 21 until I beat Misty so on and so forth. And lastly I don't think this is really a rule but if I white out it's game over. And finally just because I feel like this soup doesn't have enough spice in it I'm randomizing all the Pokemon in the entire game, my starters, the wild Pokemon, and all the Pokemon that opposing trainers use will all be randomized with no limitations, meaning who knows what we're going to get here, so there's no real way to prepare. To me, this sounds like the most interesting way to give me a fun little holiday challenge. And that's pretty much it. Let's see how it goes. With the randomizer, I could be in for a very easy time, or I could be forced to reset on the first route. Don't take this video too seriously. I'm just looking to do something a little different around Christmas time. But quickly before we start, I'd like to say that if you enjoy this content, feel free to subscribe. Likes and comments are really what helps out the most here. And if you're someone who never interacts or comments, just scroll down and simply type Christmas Caterpie in the comments below so I know you are feeling the holiday spirit. And without further ado, sit back, grab yourself some Execute Nog, and let's enjoy the video. As we begin our journey today, there will be no resetting for good DVs, and now it comes to perhaps the most important part of the run, what are our randomized starters? We have Golduck, Gyarados, and Vaporeon, all water types. While I do appreciate both Golduck and Vaporeon, Gyarados is very strong, and although it hasn't been featured in any of my How Fast series videos, we'll get a little taste of what's to come if I ever do that video. I name him Gary, and now we are on our way. To quickly go over why Gyarados is such a strong level 5 Pokemon, it's mainly because because of Dragon Rage, it does a flat 40 points of HP damage and will murder just about anything in the base game all the way up to about the SSN and 3rd gym area. It also has Hydro Pump for good measure. Also check out that Golem Sprite here. Uh, I've been doing Generation 1 runs for about half a year at this point and this is the first time I've ever seen it. He looks like a damn frog. I love it. After delivering Oak's Parcel, I immediately pick up some Pokeballs and I head down to see what our first Pokemon will be. Golem would be cool, but it turns out it's a Lapras and I can't complain about this one and we are definitely starting strong but take a second to see how hard it is to catch some of these Pokemon. Despite only being level 3, the balls just straight up miss and this is a potential problem I didn't even think of. What if I get a second stage Pokemon or a legendary on a route? Imagine the difficulty and amount of balls that I'll need. Anyways I eventually catch it and ignore that I forget to nickname it and pretend that its name is Chubb for now until I get to the name raider later in the game. I then head west of Viridian for our second encounter and it's a Goldeen. That's three water types and I don't even want it so I just I deny it and I move on. I grind a little bit on the previous route since there's a wild golem for easy experience for my water types and then I go for my third encounter to the north and it's an Omastar. And at this point I'm wondering if my game only contains water types but at this stage I'll take anything I can get. But this is what I was talking about on Lapras. I get this thing down to next to nothing. It has barely any visible health left and it breaks out of every single Pokeball so I'm forced to knock it out and take the experience. Omastar is a really ugly sprite but you never get to see that one either. Just look at it. Maybe the game did me a favor here by not letting me catch uh, Cthulhu Jr. over here. I grind a tiny bit more and I move on to Viridian Forest for our next encounter and it's Wigglytuff which is a Pokemon I actually like so I don't mind this. I go to bite it with Gyarados to soften it up a little bit. 
but I crit and it dies. Very cool. I'm not having much luck on these early encounters. From there, I'm just going to battle the bug catchers to distribute some experience to my Pokemon. And you can see how the randomizer just works, how it is in action. Primate, Rhyhorn, Jolteon, so on and so forth. It's interesting, but you understand how it works. And I can't show all the minor trainer battles unless something of note happens. Outside of the forest, it's our last encounter before Brock. And it's a Weeping Bell. Not a bad Pokemon, once again. But I just can't catch it. It breaks out of all of my balls despite only being level 2. Randomizers are a fickle mistress. My current Pokemon are too strong to soften it up and I can't catch it at full health so what can you do? I move on. Now I feel like I'm at a sufficient level to take on Brock and I wonder what he has in store for us. Well friends, it's a fucking Mewtwo right from the start. I'm extremely worried that this might be already done for. Turn 1, it disables my one and only attacking move on Lapras so I'm forced to swap into Gyarados. I take a Swift on the swap and I go for Dragon Rage but Mewtwo obviously outspeeds me and it crits from a confusion it takes me down to 12 HP. The Rage does good damage but Mewtwo is the strongest Pokemon in the game and has way more than 40 HP unlike most Pokemon and I'm in trouble. I stay in, I stare death directly in the face, it goes for a Swift, I hang on with 2 HP and I'm able to take it out in the next turn. And luckily Brock's last Pokemon is just a Paris. Since I'm on set mode and 2 HP, I have to go back into Lapras. It's not a great matchup and it has Bide. At first I'm playing things slow and correctly by growling in on the Bide turns, but eventually I get a little impatient and I take a lot of damage, way more than I expected from a Bide, but eventually I whittle it down and I survive. A scary encounter to get our first badge. Honestly this is a pretty cool fight and seeing Mewtwo made me crack a smile a little bit. I'm not even gonna lie about it. This is what makes randomizers really fun to me because you never just you never know. From there, I carefully battle the trainers up until I get to the next patch of grass for our next encounter and it's a Diglett and I actually manage to catch it. I name it Burt. Ground types are a valuable type of coverage and from there I move my way towards Mount Moon. Our encounter there turns out to be a Venusaur and that's just fantastic. I go for a bite. It does a lot of damage but luckily I don't kill it. I'm able to catch it after several Pokeballs miss. Miraculously, I get it done. I name this one Urkel. 90s kids will know what I'm talking about. From there I spend some time grinding up my Pokemon to suitable levels because it's a necessity in Nuzlocke's, although it's very tedious. And that's just the nature of permadeath games. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Slow and cautious will always win out in the end and I know that a full reset will cost me a lot more time than the grinding that I'm doing now in the long run. Eventually I start picking up trainers I skipped in the previous routes because I now have a cap of level 21. But just look at this pincer sprite. It's easily the worst sprite that I've ever seen out of every Gen 1 sprite. It looks like a four year old drew it and it's such a jarring departure from the pincer that we all know today. It's so bad I just I had to write it into the script. Just look at it. Don't look away. Look into its eyes. From there it's slow and steady through Mount Moon. I do find but I'd like to point out trainers like this that start out with a vile plume against my team that isn't well equipped for it. His second Pokemon is an Omanite which is why Whatever, and then he has a random Charizard at the end and you just don't see these Pokemon ever so it's kind of a shock to see them. But what about this Rocket Grunt here that usually has that single Raticate? Now he has an Articuno. I have to swap and I really don't have a great answer outside of Gyarados and then it gets a neutral Ice Beam that crits me and it has me sweating here. The run almost ended right here. I'm being too loose and risky. I'm not respecting the randomizer in this battle and I have to start changing that. Now moving over to Cerulean and our encounter on this route is Nidorino. I catch it and I name it Wayne and you're not going to be seeing much Wayne in this video. Sorry if you're a fan of Wayne. Next up is rival number two. He leaves with Lapras and I have our good friend Bird out and I have to swap into Venusaur. I get put to sleep and it drags on for a long time but Lapras really can't do anything to Venusaur but eventually some Vine Whips get us through. Dodrio is next and I make a dumb mistake of not swapping immediately. Instead I toss out a Leech Seed but I take a super effective Peck first and that does a lot of damage. I swap back to Lapras and I whittle it down with some Water Guns as it pecks and growls at me and the next up is a Dragonite. I get paralyzed but I put it to sleep and I keep growling at it to reduce its attacks. Eventually I swap into my safety blanket Gyarados. It never wakes up and this one wasn't really as scary as I initially thought it might be. And now for the last Pokemon. What monstrous Pokemon awaits? Well guys it's a Weedle and that's pretty much a done deal. I took some damage but overall I think my team can handle pretty much anything if I'm smart and I keep the levels up. Afterwards I finish up Nugget Bridge and I just want to point out this Execute. Look how long this battle takes. Is this what I was doing 
annoying to people in my execute video. It's so weak that at the end of the day, it was just annoying and it takes forever. I do have to swap a couple of times and go back to my safety blanket and Dragon Rage Gyarados to get past this bad memory. Now it's time for another encounter, and it's a Pidgeot. It does not want to be caught, but eventually it accepts its fate, and we have a new member of the team. I name him Roger. From there, a lot of the team is getting close to that level 21 cap, and to raise that, I go ahead and travel to Misty. She starts off with an electrode, and while I don't think it has any electric moves, I do swap just to be safe. Venusaur isn't amazing in this matchup. I go all the way down to a mere 5 hit points before I manage to take it out, and it was a lot closer than I initially thought it would be. Her ace is Snorlax. I swap to Lapras, and my initial thoughts was to put it to sleep and chip away. It gets off an amnesia, it wakes up immediately after a sing, and then it gets an X defend, and this thing's defensive stats are just through the roof at this point. I use Sing again, and I make a swap to Gyarados. It wakes up immediately because of course it does, and I go for a Hydro Pump, and for some reason it does the most pathetic non-resisted damage I've ever seen a Hydro Pump do. I tank a headbutt and then I remember I have the almighty dragon rage and Snorlax comfortably survives it. It gets another headbutt off and I'm getting really low but the next dragon rage does finish it off and what was a really tough battle to get the second badge, Snorlax is not a joke. I teach Bubble Beam to the Lapras, and then I finish up the route to Phil's house to get that sweet experience without too much of a hassle. And next up is the Rocket Grunt with Dig. He has a Squirtle, and Bird is pretty powerful, albeit a little frail. I get the one shot, and then Poliwrath comes out. I do really good damage, and guys, it was only a matter of time before tragedy struck. Bert the Diglett is trained, he's ready to go, he's a valuable member of the team, but a critical hit body slam just takes his life. He was way too young, and I was not ready for this. And let's get a uh, let's get a RIP Bert in the comments. And now it's time for a quick mini rant on my thoughts about Nuzlocke as a whole. It's more of a systematic problem with permadeath games and survival style genres as a whole, but in Nuzlocke, your ultimate goal is to avoid the metaphorical minefields like what just happened and just surviving. Unlike in a solo run where the goal is to race the clock and get the fastest time against other runs where you get to test things out a lot. The solution and the best way to play around permadeath is to be slow, methodical, and grind a lot. And this applies even with hard level caps like I've implemented for this run. The long and short of what I'm trying to say and what I'm trying to articulate here is that nuzlocks are just really slow. If you want to minimize your losses and be successful, prepare to spend a lot of time. And losing Burt right there just means that I'm in more of a cautious mode mindset moving forward. You guys aren't going to feel the grind since I'm editing a video and you're just going to be watching it, but just know that even at this point, just after the second gym, I'm already at more in-game time than about seven or eight of my solo runs that were fully completed by this time. The encounter on the route below Cerulean is a Graveler. It fights like hell, like they all seem to do before I capture it. And I named this one Gary, but with two R's, so don't get it confused with Gary the Gyarados that only has a single R. Remember that, two R's. I then move on to Diglett K for my counter and I get the savior of the run Starmie. Obviously I cannot name it Patrick since I did that for my solo run video but I do name it Pat with two T's just like Matt and it's a lot different right? And I hate to reveal this information now but my catches and counters to this point are essentially all I'm going to be using. It takes forever just to train up four, five, six Pokemon as it is and I'm just going to take advantage of grinding, keeping my levels up and doing the slow and cautious play so I don't really catch or use any other Pokemon outside of what I got now. Starmie is now my win condition, and you know how strong it is from my solo run video. I have other strong Pokemon in front to form a solid core, and I can pretty much close out anything in the game that it wants to throw at me with a Starmie if I can keep it alive and keep its levels up. I grind more, and eventually that leads us to the SSN. I pick up Body Slam, and I teach it to Lapras, which was a huge mistake. Lapras naturally learns Body Slam at level 25, so I just wasted one of the game's most powerful early game TMs, but what can you do about it? Outside of that, I pick up the Rare Candy but I don't grind additional trainers because I'm already getting close to my level 24 cap on my Pokemon and now it's time for rival number three. His team is interesting, Mr. Mime, Blastoise, Arcanine, and Kangaskhan, but this battle showcases how strong Lapras is and I was really impressed. It's absurdly bulky and it intrigues me for a choice that I never really even thought about for a solo run. Either way, this one is easy and we're moving on. I go around looking for a Pokemon to use Cut. Maybe it's against the rules since Venusaur could have just used it, but I do pick up an Oddish. I name it Cut Boy for the sole purpose of not bogging down my team with an HM. And if you don't like it, send me an angry comment down below with a mad emoji. After that, it's time for Lieutenant Surge. And I wasn't too worried about this, 
He has three Pokemon to my five Pokemon, and we've trained up near the level 24 cap. He leaves with Psyduck, and I've done this solo run. I know his ass only has Scratch, so it's not an issue. I take it out. Next up is my champ. I put it to sleep, and I body slam it down without too much issue. And his ace is a Cloyster, and while it's very defensively tanky, sleep puts a whole lot of body slams, gets us past the spot, and it's another Lapras showcase. I'm further impressed by this beautiful bitch. He gives us Thunderbolt, and I'm very surprised that Lapras can actually learn it, but I do the responsible thing here and I give it to our designated closer in Starmie. It can make much better use with its high special stat, and Lapras isn't really necessarily an offensive powerhouse. Gyarados was also an option for Thunderbolt, but Starmie is just better all around. I'm well equipped to make it through Rock Tunnel without any issues at all, so that means we can pick right back up in Celadon. The first order of business is to go to the Pokemart, get water for the guards, and some extra for those juicy and pivotal TMs. At this point, I go for Ice Beam on the Lapras since it gets a stab bonus. Then I get Rock Slide for Gary with two R's. And then I teach Thunderbolt finally to the Starmie that I mentioned earlier. And this is a decent power spot, but it doesn't end there. I pick up Fly. After failing my next two encounters, I do pick up Psychic for Starmie. And I'm really surprised that Lapras can actually learn Psychic too. Why has no one done a video on Lapras yet? It doesn't make any sense. I know I'm gushing over Lapras, but it just keeps surprising me. From there, it's just a matter of grinding. Our cap is raised after surge to level 29 and single use TMs of generation 1 means that mistakes will cost you the most powerful moves in the game so this feeds back into my rant earlier about the slog but it's absolutely necessary. You don't want to lose moves like Thunderbolt, Ice Beam, and Psychic which in my opinion are the best offensive moves in the entire game. I continue to do this for a while before I move on. After that it's time for the rocket hideout. I battle some trainers, but not too much, and then it's time for Giovanni number one. He leads with Ponyta, and that's perfect. I'm running a triple water core, so it has nothing it can really do against me, and I take it out swiftly. Next up is Electabuzz, and obviously electric types are a huge weakness to most of our team, and this is why Gary with two R's is so valuable. It walls off all the electric types, and this is its job, but the triple water squad can just clean up anything else after that. His last Pokemon is Lapras, and although it's very beautiful, we have Thunderbolt on Starmie, it can clean things up. Now it's time for Erica, but first look at this random Zapdos. It's easily the best electric type in Kanto, and it's just a great example of things that Gary with two R's is supposed to handle like he does here. As for the gym battle, she leads with a full picks, and like I mentioned earlier, fire types are exactly what we want to see, and that's on to the next one very quick. Second up is Golduck. It unsuccessfully goes for multiple disables while I body slam it until it gets paralyzed, and I take it out while it basically does nothing. And last but not least is another Golduck. I would crunch the numbers to see the odds of this happening, but I know it's very low. The thing about this Golduck is that it has Mega Drain for some reason, although Golduck is actually incapable of learning Mega Drain. I guess it's because it's Erica's A and she knows Mega Drain is the TM she gives you, but who knows. Either way, it's annoying, but it doesn't give Lapras too much trouble, and I body slam it down after putting it to sleep for a few turns at the start. This is another easy gem, and we're done. With the fourth gem down, our level cap balloons up to level 43, since both Sabrina and Koga have the same cap, and they can be fought in either order. I'll talk about it more in a bit, but first, we have more pressing matters for rival number four, the world's easiest rival battle. I'm leading with Starmie, since I was at the current cap, and I want to get some easy experience. The battle starts off with an Alakazam, and I don't have a great counter, but all of my Pokemon will do just fine against it. I stay in with Starmie, and I just Thunderbolt it down, and we move on. The second Pokemon is Flareon, and fire is what I like to see. While I don't have crazy powerful water type moves on Starmie just yet, Water Gun does the job just fine. Flareon is a pretty awful Pokemon in Generation 1, let me just say that. It has fantastic attack, but the best moves that it can use are special, so it just uses quick attack before being put down like the dog it is. Next up is Weedle, and Weedle is the Bruno of Pokemon. Seeing Weedles outside of these starting areas is actually hilarious, but sometimes the randomizer just throws you a bone and it just be like that sometimes, you know? And last up is Nidorino, and I don't even use Psychic for some reason. It just goes down to a Water Gun crit and just like that, we're on the last Pokemon. It's a Slowbro, and although Slowbro is my favorite Pokemon, I gotta do what I gotta do. Starmie's superb coverage means that I just use Thunderbolt and I take it out. It was an easy battle, but let's be real, Bravo number four, even on the worst solo run, is always easy. I finish up the tower, grab the Pokey Flute, and I move on to the next obstacle. I make my way down to Fuchsia, and next up is the Safari Zone. 
I encounter an Articuno, and I have a better chance of walking outside and finding a Lamborghini with $3 million in the passenger seat outside of my apartment than I do of catching this legendary Beaky Boy. Obviously, it runs on the first safari ball that I throw, and I shouldn't have even bothered. I should've just threw a stone at it and moved on with my life. It's hard enough to even catch like a female Nidoran, much less one of the game's four legendary Pokemons with these weak safari balls. I hate the safari zone. Afterwards, I pick up the last two HMs, and Surf is actually very important for this run. Three of my main Pokemon can use it and they can benefit from the stab surf since HMs are reusable. It means that it's a pretty decent power spike. You don't get much more use out of an HM than this. Now let's talk about that ballooning level cap. It's a 14 level jump from Erica to Koga and Sabrina and I'm in the fake fighting gym in Saffron and I never visit this place but I need so many levels. This is how it's got to be. I'm going places that I'll never visit again to accomplish this massive jump in levels to ensure I don't have to reset. I visit the route east of Fuchsia as well, and the last time I had been there was probably as a child. I also clear out Silphco completely of all of its trainers on my quest to get my team up to speed. It's a mentally exhausting task, and easily where the bulk of my time was spent on this run. It goes without saying that I absolutely loathe this part of the run, but at least it went smooth albeit at a snail's pace including lots of healing to not take any unnecessary risk. I grind up as far as my sanity will allow and that gets us 4 Pokemon at a good level. Lapras and Starmie are capped at level 43, Graveler is slightly behind at level 41, and then Gyarados is at 38. That's sufficient enough. From this point on I'm just going to be doing 4 Pokemon and I'm just going to brute force my way through the rest of this game. And unfortunately Urkel the Venusaur is just going to be left behind. Sorry buddy, Grass Tops with a zero coverage moves just aren't worth spending another hour hour getting up to level 40. That leads us to Koga and god damn it it's an execute. This thing refuses to leave me alone. It paralyzes me and it's annoying but Dragon Rage does get the job done from Gyarados who is in our first slot to get some levels since he's pretty behind. Marowak is up next. It's weak to water and I fight through the paralysis to get off a hydro pump to quickly move past this one as well. Kabutops is his third Pokemon and this is another sprite you'll never see but it's a water rock type meaning that hydro pump does massive neutral damage but it doesn't one shot it. It gets off a pathetic absorb and I eventually take it out too. Muck is his last Pokemon and it's oddly thematic for Koga's usual poison team. I make the call to switch to Gary with two R's since it heavily resists poison and it also has access to super effective earthquake. So after taking some minor damage and then getting poisoned, I do blast it down with a super effective damage and I take this gem no problem. And since I cleared Sylph already, it's immediately time for rival number 5 after the badge. This is normally a tough challenge, but the randomizer is always the mixed bag so let's see what happens. He starts off with a Beedrill and I'm leading Lapras. I go for a Confuse Ray because I respect the Beedrill and it turns out that Surf is just a one shot so I shouldn't have even respected it at all. Next up is Ekans, another weak Pokemon that a Surf can easily take out in one hit and I can't say I'm mad about that. Then he throws out a female Nidoran, which is basically just Ekans number two. It meets the same exact fate. This one is looking pretty trivial unless he pulls out some big guns. Up next is a Gyarados. The smart play here would be to switch to Starmie for the Thunderbolt, but Lapras is so bulky that I just confuse it. I get off a neutral Ice Beam, it hurts itself, and a second Ice Beam takes it out. And Lapras does level to 44, which means I'm past the cap. But please guys, don't tell my mom. Comment below to assure me that you're not gonna Killer. Primeape is up next and fighting types against Lapras wouldn't be good in later gens but it only learns 150 base power move so it may not even have that at all and it's so frail that I'm not even worried. I take it out and it was an easy fight and another one that Lapras just soloed. I'm telling you guys Lapras solo run might be pretty nutty and I need to see it if no one else is going to do it. Now it's time for Giovanni number 2 and let's just get this out of the way. He leads with an Executor and I lead with the Gyarados. I'm thinking that this is going to be easy and smooth but I get put to sleep and then he just starts beating my ass and he forces me to swap. I bring in Lapras for that sweet super effective ice beam and then I move past. And ladies and gentlemen, next up, it's Caterpie, and he's here to hurt my entire family. What a monster. I was so scared that the run might be over right here at this very moment. Next up is Krabby, and it's definitely a step up from the Caterpie, but it's another Pokemon that I'm very familiar with since so I've done a solo run. Body Slam's taken out eventually, and I easily tank whatever little tickles he wants to give to me. Finally, it's Doug Trio. It's a respectable level and can do a ton of damage, but unfortunately for it, it's weak to water, and that means it's going down in a single surf, no questions asked. And that's Giovanni number two. Let's keep it moving on. That leads us to Sabrina. And I lead with Gyarados. And she leads with Parasect. I go for Hydro Pump because I forget that... 
Parasect this half grass. Fortunately, it doesn't go for Spore, which is the most broken move in the game. It misses two stun spores, and then the dragon rages start adding up, and I take it out. Next up is Kabuto, and about all there is to say about this is it's a cute little sprite. It's cool to see all these sprites I normally don't get to see, but this is a one pump and done Pokemon. Next up is Vileplume, and Petal Dance presents a threat to most of our team. Gyarados is probably the best answer since it only does neutral damage with its flying subtyping, so I stay in. Petal Dance does respectable damage, but Dragon Rage does fine even at this level to take us on to the end. Sabrina's Ace is a level 43 Haunter, and just to finish this one off clean, I do swap to Gary with two R's, I get off an Earthquake, and we get our sixth badge. Now it's time for a brisk swim down to Cinnabar. I battle trainers in the mansion and inside of Blaine's Gym, and that leads us to a Nuzlocke edition of Tombstoner, brother, before moving on to Blaine. I'm leading Lapras, he starts off with a Butterfree, it's weak to Ice Beam, and that's all there really is to that. Second is Drowsy. I go for Confused Ray, take some minor damage, and two Body Slams finishes this one off. Voltorb is next, and it's one of those dumb Generation 1 Pokemon where it's an electric Pokemon and typing along, and it only can learn normal moves through leveling up. It goes for a Swift, and I swiftly nuke it down with a Surf after that. Last up is his new Ace Jigglypuff. What a terrifying Pokemon. I'm suspecting it to try to put me to sleep, but I do outspeed it. I crit with a body slam and will never need to worry about the answer to that question. That's seven gems down with one to go. In Viridian, I battle the underling trainers in the gym for experience and then I challenge Giovanni. Lapras is on deck once again because it's such a safe lead and he brings out Seedra. I go for a Confuse Ray and the idea is just to body slam it down. It does have smoke screen and it makes this a little more annoying than it needs to be, but the end result is just the same before it goes down. And hey look guys, once again it's our old friend Execute and I have Ice Beam to quickly move us on before we get annoyed too much. Giovanni brings in a Pidgeotto and there's a developing theme ice beam. I clip this bird's wings and we move on quickly once again. Then he brings in Charmander and uh oh Giovanni might just be all the way weak to Lapras. I take it out with a serve and let's see if Lapras can get the clean sweep once again. Last is Voltorb and it's not a complete weakness to Lapras but we just saw Voltorb. He's not a threat. It just actually uses explode just to save me the trouble and that ends the fight and that's eight badges down. Now let's move it rapid fire straight into rival number six and see how this one goes. I lead Lapras once again and the worst case scenario strikes. It's a Zapdos lead and this is what Gary with two R's is made for but I do the dumbest and riskiest thing I could possibly do. I just stay in. I go for a first turn Confuse Ray. I take a Thunderstruck but it doesn't look that bad yet. Turn two it fights to the confusion and it crits on a Thunderstruck. My life flashed before my eyes. I do barely survive. It does heavy damage and an Ice Beam does take it out. I gotta say that past mat is pretty stupid but it worked so who am I to complain? Next Next up is a measly Sandshrew, and Surf is just gonna smack this one down before it can even take a breath. He brings in a Poliwhirl, and I'm done pressing my luck, so I make the pivot over to Starmie. I take a Body Slam for minor damage for my trouble, and I one hit it with Psychic, although it's, that's a mistake because I just keep thinking that this is Poliwrath. I should have used Thunderbolt, but no harm, no foul. His next Pokemon is a cute little Kabuto, and Thunderbolt electrocutes it down onto the next. Now it's time for Rhyhorn. This little guy's times four weak to Surf, we already know. He dies a really gruesome death right when it leaves its Pokeball. I actually feel kind of bad for it. And last but not least, it's an actual Poliwrath. And since it's actually half fighting type, Psychic does great here. And surprisingly, it's actually not a one shot. I take a double slap and then I finish off the fight right after that. I head to Victory Road. I'm completely over grinding, but I do opt not to use Repel so that I can battle the higher level encounters. And I do fight some of the trainers in here just to make sure I'm not under leveled. After that, I fly back to Celadon. I buy a Reflect TM and then I buy as many vitamins as I can to sure up the stats of my Pokemon before heading to the Elite Four. Now for some final touches, I teach Blizzard for coverage and also reflect for some strategy onto Gyarados. The idea for the Elite Four here is going to be to lead with Gyarados, set up reflect for the entire battle, deal with the teams the best that I can, and then eventually pivot over to Starmie, set up some badge boost with Harden, and close out the battles that way. I use up all of my rare candies, I split them up evenly between my four Pokemon, but I do give the most love to Starmie so it can be as strong as possible moving forward. And now it's time for the final battles. Am I prepared? 
I think so, but I'm definitely not grinding anymore because I just can't stand it. I do make a big mistake here, but we'll talk about it later when it's relevant and I actually realize it in the run when I'm playing. So let's jump into Lorelei and see if the Reflect Starmie closing strategy works for us. She leads with the thematic Jinx. It goes for Thrash and then I set up Reflect. I go for Dragon Rage a few times and while Thrash does do its thing, it's being halved by the Reflect. Jinx gets low and from that point I decide, let's go ahead and try the pivot into Starmie already. It's eventually going to get confused from the Thrash anyway. I have Reflect up and every other move it has should be resisted. I set up Hardens for the badge boost until I take a Thrash critical hit and that takes me to about half health and then I, at that point I have to go ahead and pull the trigger. A Surf does take it out and move us on to the fight. Lorelai brings in a War Turtle. I'm already boosted. I have Thunderbolt so that means we are moving on very quickly. And then she brings in a second Jinx. It's pretty bulky against special attacks and a Surf does not one hit it but it does only a double slap and retaliation and the next Surf does take us on in the fight. Next to last is Beedrill and we can just all agree that Beedrill is a cool Pokemon but it's pretty subpar and on top of that it's just weak to Psychic. It gets obliterated swiftly and that brings us on to the end. And it just turns out to be a Vulpix and Fire Tops are exactly what we want to see. I've said that like a hundred times especially weak and unevolved ones. One Surf is all that's needed here and while Starmie did take some damage in the fight the strategy went exactly how I wanted it to go. Next up is Bruno and I can't really trash talk him because the randomizer is probably the best thing that's ever going to happen to him except that he leads with a Paris which is very Bruno like. I set up reflect and perhaps I should have instantly pivoted here but instead it just goes for leech life a bunch and I just dragon rage it down. Next up is a Gyarados mirror match and finally Bruno has a good Pokemon. It's higher level than me and my blizzard barely does any damage. After I take a hyper beam I decide that this is a losing battle and I have to swap during the free turn that it'll be recharging to start a setup. I take a dragon rage set up only one harden because it's too risky to continue doing so and then I finish it off with a times four super effective thunderbolt. Pidgeot comes in I immediately go for thunderbolt but I'm not fully boosted here so it doesn't kill it. I then decide to set up some more hardens I take some small chip damage in return and eventually I do finish this one off with another bolt and we move on in the fight. Bruno then brings in a butterfree and it's another flying type that's weak to Thunderbolt. It's one and done and we see the last Pokemon and it's a Pidgey and this is pretty low even for Bruno. Maybe a Weedle would be worse but Thunderbolt is good enough here and that goes without saying. It's sad because the middle of his team actually had some promise but you are not going to be beating me with a Paris and a Pidgey you no shirt wearing Neanderthal. That brings us to Agatha and we've done this so far with just two Pokemon. She leads a Poliwhirl and Gary is starting to get outsped every battle but that's just fine. I take a Body Slam, I set up Reflect, then I take another Body Slam. I get paralyzed and I'm getting semi low. I do push my luck for no reason whatsoever but I get lucky that he just goes for a double slap. I do as much Dragon Rage damage as I dare before I swap over to the Starmie. I take minor damage, I do set up some Hardens and then Agatha makes an aggressive swap over to Nidoking King for some reason. I go for Psychic and it's super effective damage is enough to take it out in one hit. Poliwhirl then comes back in and watching the footage I'm just really confused why I keep going for Psychic against this pure water type. I know it's not a fighting type I know that and I should be going for Thunderbolt it's not it, it works it's just I don't understand why I'm past me's doing this it's confusing. Next up is Kakuna and this is just a free pass there's nothing to commentate on here it's over and then the randomizer decides to be funny and it brings in a Metapod directly after the Kakuna I guess this battle is pretty much over right? Well friends maybe not so fast her ace is a level 60 mutant to. I go for Thunderbolt. It does crit, but it does tiny little baby damage while it goes for a resisted psychic that crits and takes me well low in the process. Please God, not like this. I debate on my next course of action and I decide that it's Lapras's time to shine. I swap in, do a Confuse Ray to hopefully mitigate more damage, and then I start body slamming away. It does take me down to about less than half health, but eventually Lapras does come away with a win, and this one was probably one more bad crit from going really south. The Crisis is a vertical for now and we're done with this one. Now it's time for Lance and let's hope there isn't a Mewtwo hiding in the back here as well. He leads with a Wigglytuff and I forgot that I was paralyzed. I'm basically just asking to die at this point. It misses a double slap and then I set up the pivotal reflect. Since I'm paralyzed I do make the swap to Gary with two R's and it just keeps putting me to sleep and going for defense curls and by the time I get off an earthquake the damage is very pathetic. I then decide to make a second swap back into Lapras. I go for Surf. I get a generation one miss which is 
1 in 256 chance and it uses Disable on Surf and things are annoying but I'm not getting discouraged just yet. I critically hit with an Ice Beam the following turn but it's just not enough. Wigglytuff is dummy thick and it gets a Hyper Potion so we're back at square one. Two more Ice Beams finishes the job and let's see if this fight gets better. Almostar comes in. Surf is great here but it's still disabled. I go for a Confused Ray and it hits itself. I then go for a Body Slam and the damage is pretty sad but Surf does become available again and after taking some small damage I take it out. Next up is Oddish and this is looking a lot better. Ice Beam is all that's needed to get past this one. Then another Polyrath comes in and although fighting moves are pretty sad I don't want to risk body slamming this thing and I do swap the Starmie. I do take a body slam for my troubles and a single Psychic is enough to take this one out. I'm hoping for no Mewtwo in the back and it turns out it's just my little brother Staryu. I have Thunderbolt and I outspeed it so this is a done deal. I finish off the battle easily. It was a pretty rough start with that Wigglytuff though. Now remember when I said I made a mistake? It was that because I didn't remember to buy enough potions. I don't, I don't know why I did this. I'm out and I cannot fully heal my party. It's not a huge deal but two out of my four main Pokemon at this point are at about 70% health so let's hope that this doesn't cost us. I also have two Pokemon in the party for some sacrifices if need be so let's just see how it goes. The champion tosses out a Ghastly to lead. I want to set up Reflect and I get met with a Hypnosis. I don't want to risk sitting around to wake up so I make the swap to Gary with two R's and I just hope there's not a Zapdos hiding in the back. I get confused, I take a Nightshade for some big damage and then I hit myself in confusion. I'm too low to risk it and I get outsped anyway so I'm forced to make another swap. I bring back in the Gyarados and the AI, I just feel like the AI cheated here. It went for a preemptive Dream Eater despite the Pokemon that was in not being asleep. Obviously it's going to crit and things are just going south pretty quick. I have to make another swap. This time we're making our first sacrifice. Sorry Roger, it is what it is bud. You've been a pretty good airplane for us this run but I have to let you go. With a fresh start after the sacrifice, I bring in Starmie. I outspeed it and I have super effective Psychic and that takes it out in one hit. These last couple of battles have been very tough at the start but let's hope it continues the trend of getting easier. Tangela is up next and I'm just going to set up all the hardens in the world. That's going to give me the best chance to win and eventually it does put me to sleep. It's very annoying but Tangela has one of the worst learn sets of all Pokemon and I'm not even worried at all. I'll just take this slight little nap and it'll help star me to focus up. Eventually I do wake up, two psychics take it out and I have slightly more than 50% health remaining. Next up is Ninetales and that's just fantastic. It's just what we want to see. I set up two more hardens here and I could have possibly done more but I just didn't want to be too risky. Afterwards I go for Surf and now we are halfway through the fight. Venomoth is the next Pokemon and this is what makes Starmie so good. I guess it's more of a product of having Thunderbolt and Psychic in general but the coverage is just so good the chances of the opponent bringing in something that I can take out in one hit is very high. One super effective Psychic does the trick here. The penultimate Pokemon of the final battle is a Jigglypuff and I can one shot this terrible monster with a single Surf before making our way to the very end. And the very last Pokemon we'll see in this run is Weeping Bell. I would say that it's very random but that's the whole point guys. Unfortunately for Weeping Bell it's half poison and Psychic isn't gonna feel great. I do take it out in one hit and that's the Nuzlocke completed. And as much as I bitched a little bit I did have a great time. It's fun to change it up. I didn't enjoy the time spent grinding and I definitely hated going through like eight hours of it to edit but it is what it is. I'm not mad about it. So let's get to the Hall of Fame. We got Gary the Gyarados. His starting presence with Dragon Rage carried the early game and putting Reflect on to support the team at the end game was key for this run. Next is Gary with two R's the Graveler. I didn't always have to utilize him but walling off electric tops and having stab rock slides and earthquakes is always useful to have in your back pocket no matter what run you're doing. And now for the MVPs of the run, Chub the Lapper surprised me a lot. Whether it be its extreme bulk, high HP, or the ability just to sweep battles all on its own or the moves that it can actually learn, we'll just talk more about Lapras soon. Finally the closer, Pat with two T's, the star me. I've done a video on it and I've said multiple times, you know it's great, but protecting it, letting it come into a safe matchup, set up hardens for the batch boost, and using its great special stat with strong coverage moves to sweep, it felt almost unbeatable, it was great. And here's some honorable 
mentions. Uh, we got Urkel the Venusaur. I definitely thought I was going to use more of it and more was going to come out of this, but I just didn't have the patience or time to grind up a fifth team member, and it got left behind. Good Pokemon. I love Venusaur, but my time is more valuable than getting him up. Last up, Roger. The level 12 Pidgeot gets a Hall of Fame nomination just based off of the one single time it was used in battle, just as a meat shield to let Starmie get into the battle without taking a hit from the Ghastly. Now overall, this is a 13 hour playthrough. I think some of the time is slightly inflated. I might have kept the game on and left the room a few times, but overall it's fairly accurate. It took a lot of time to grind up, especially on that level cap jump from Erica to Koga and Sabrina all the way up to 43. I think I could probably could have finished two to four, maybe even five solo runs, edited them, rendered them, and uploaded them in the time it took to do this one, but it's Christmas time guys. I had to mix it up a little bit, but I got my Nuzlocke fixed. I'm not convinced that I'll ever do another one unless this video gets like a thousand likes, which is impossible. I'll go ahead and call that right now, but I think that's about time for the video. I'm probably going to take some time off. We got the holidays coming up, then I have a birthday, and then I have New Year's, and just all that kind of stuff. I'm going to be busy, and I would just prefer to enjoy myself rather than worry about getting the content out, especially since this one took such a long time. But the takeaway from this is that Lapras is super intriguing for a solo run. You probably look for that in the future sometime. Gyarados wasn't on my radar either, but it's definitely looking great if he was ever to get his own solo run. Anyways, I hope you had a great holiday season and just a great year in general, and I hope the next year treats you all great. I definitely plan to keep making videos, but I suspect that I might slow down as some games are going to be coming out like Elden Ring in February, and while I would love to do content on that, the Piplup video that I did just shows that my views in general, it's just not worth the time to do long, drawn out videos like that that take me like 30 hours to do. It's just not worth it. But with that said, if you're still here at this point in the video, I appreciate you. And I'll probably see you in two or three weeks. I don't know. Who, who knows? But I'll see you again in the next video. Bye!